And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me, I have a returning good brother to the temple, the godfather of the Inversion 20 system, the man behind the, cur behind the recently released Tattered Magics, the man who is not to be confused with any sort of Fitz magic or Fitz tragic, Brian Fitzpatrick. How are you doing today, man? I am good. Thank you for having me back. I appreciate it. Mm -hmm. So, I know I know it's been a I know it's been a hot a hot few months since um since I had you on for Aliens and Asteroids. Um, so so you you had put out um Tattered Magics of um fairly recently, um. And one of the things I was curious about was, was a project like Tattered Magic something that you always had in the back burner, even when you were working on Aliens and Asteroids? Um, so when we were done with Aliens and Asteroids, I was debating whether we were going to try to go with a traditional fantasy variety of the system or something else and along the way i wrote an adventure for what i called the weird west that involved a wild west town that was infested with demons so think of it as modern with a little bit of magic thrown in using the inverse 20 system and uh that was kind of my test bed it was kind of one of those Let's see what happens if we open up the door a little wider and allow people to do things like martial arts and crazy uh, martial arts movie kind of style magic. And what happens if we have a werebear? Why? Because somebody wanted to play a werebear. Mm -hmm. um, and remarkably, it all worked really well. And that set me off on this lovely uh, vision quest of trying to figure out whether a Western was the best approach uh, or maybe we should go with something along the lines of an urban fantasy in, set in the modern day. So something along the lines of the Alex Veris or uh, Dresden Files or Iron Druid series, which I am a huge urban fantasy fan. I've devoured multiple or series from a bunch of different authors and have always, that's always had a soft spot in my heart for it. So I decided rather than go with the difficult social fabric that Westerns typically bring with them, that we would go with a more established um open-ended less conflicted uh social narrative that goes with urban fantasy so wizards and vampires and werewolves uh and monsters so anything you can think of to do in like um a dresden files like modern magic or if you're going like uh buffy the vampire slayer or even Scooby-Doo adventures, you could probably spin this this system to do any of those uh, in a variety of ways and have a good time. So it wasn't my initial goal to go with urban fantasy, but it turned out to be probably the best decision that we could have made um, with this system as a dry run for what we think is going to be next. So we can talk about that later, but I... Uh, I am excited to to play in this urban fantasy stuff because it, mm -hmm. it is such a popular genre right now as far as uh, fiction goes. And there's a lot of stuff, even on TV, if you watch, uh, there's the Fae show that's on Amazon uh, about sort of uh, industrial age fairies. I'm trying to mm -hmm. remember the name of it. Um, there's that one. There was Bright a, a couple of years ago. It's kind of seeing a little bit of a resurgence in TV. And it does show up. You know, you could have your monster feature every now and then. So monsters in the modern world and magic in the modern world. Why not? That was yeah. a long-winded answer. <laughs> 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 yeah, 
Well, it's not. It's. It's not like that's a uncommon occurrence here in the monastery. Um. Now, when when it came to, when it came time to actually sit actually sit down and and go, okay, okay, we're okay. This is getting made. Were were what were some of the main things that um had kind of that kind of got uncomfortable within um aliens and asteroids that you that had to be addressed or or gotten rid of in term in terms of design mindsets. And here we go with this again. And you're back. Yep. Um, what I was saying is when, what were, when it came, how easy or difficult was it for, was it for you to adjust the mindset from a, um, from a sem semi-hard, phrasing, space, um, space opera to a, um, modern fantasy approach when it came to actually getting thing, getting pen to paper? It actually wasn't hard. Um, the... The because of the way that the system is written, pretty much you can spin it however you want as far as um, setting, and then the character generation is pretty open ended. So it took me, I don't know, maybe a, a the better part of a couple of weeks to start figuring out what I wanted to do, and as soon as I settled on the idea of a fey invasion i knew mm -hmm. i was on the right track and it was something that i hadn't seen done before um so i wanted to kind of bring in the whole military and um modern might versus magic kind of debate what would win spells versus bullets kind of thing mm -hmm. so it kind of gave me enough of a framework to kind of flesh that out a little bit so not it didn't take me very long once we settled on going away from the western and more towards an urban fantasy. Yep. Um and what now when it comes to when it came to creating a magic system. Now, obviously um from what from what I recall in Aliens and Asteroids, even even taking the expansion books into account, there wasn't really a system for um for 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 any sort of magic equivalent, not even the temptation of um, psychics, which is a common temptation among science fiction work. But in your in your case, when it came to the conceptualization, in the early version of it, was there was there an attempt to make to make a uh, codified spell list? Oh, that's a fun question. So, in previous versions of Mobius Adventures, uh, we actually had a very gritty D and D style system uh, where we actually cod codified. I think there were seven different fields of wizardry, and we had hundreds of spells uh, that we actually put together back in the '90s around these ideas of elemental magic and uh, summoning magic and other stuff. And I, I wanted to avoid that because the idea that you would find a, like a tome of pre-written spells is kind of rare. So the whole idea that um, a wizard could create a spell on the fly using whatever mental frameworks they have or whatever um, knowledge they have to, to, to base it on, they could basically construct a new spell on the fly and do whatever they want. And the first place that this ever came up, funny enough, was in an Aliens and Asteroids adventure that I wrote where there was a group of undersea aliens who had a... Uh, they devolved. So they used to be very technologically savvy, and they had what was essentially nanite-based um, control over a lot of things. And what it turned out to be was the old uh, adage that 
any significantly advanced technology can be perceived as magic, right? Mm -hmm. So that was kind of the beginning of it. And they had the ability to create and destroy things using these nanites that they could wield using uh, a series of magic uh, staves that they had left over from the previous eons. And um, from that, I started piecing together some of the the rough outline of what I wanted it to be. I didn't want to like lock it down completely, but I wanted to have at least a rough idea of what uh, somebody could do. And the very first thing that I actually ended up doing was, what happens if you've got a kid? Think of back to any of the uh, good old horror movies that we saw when we were kids, and you had a child that was trying to protect itself against some unseen horror or monster. And they had seen or read a spell. Maybe it's religious. Maybe it was from D&D. Maybe it was from a movie. And they said, okay, I believe that this is going to work for me. So they actually burned part of their own essence to power a spell against this entity, whatever it was. Mm -hmm. How would that work? So from that was the next phase. And then from there, I just started kind of fleshing out, all right, so what are some of the, the basic types of magic that people might do? Some people might use words. So there was craft languages. Some people might do... Uh, runes or symbols in the like the Norse way, and that was craft symbols. Maybe they use um, rhythm or melody, uh, and that's craft sounds. Uh, so I kind of grouped them into a number of areas, and then started to figure out how they could um, adjust some of the energy that they gathered from those methods. So let's say you're uh, an artist and you're, you use craft symbols. If I draw uh, draw some doodles of some possible spells, that's kind of powering me up, like using your creativity to fuel your, your magic. Mm -hmm. And then trying to figure out how you use those spells, you can then use the gathered points that you've gathered using your art artistic abilities and uh, maybe create a shield uh, in the form of a circle around you. Or maybe you are putting a, a symbol on a piece of paper and using it sort of like a temporary tattoo to give yourself power. Uh, maybe you're powering up your strength like in a Hulk kind of way. Or um, maybe you're throwing uh, a magic missile at, and then talking. Toss the paper at your enemy, and it turns out to be a fireball. You know, however, however the the player and the character work together to figure out their magic. So that was kind of the fun thing, and and we're still figuring out. Even now, we're we're a year after we started playtesting this thing. Um, the book is out, and people are still surprising me with the stuff that they're coming up with. Like we used uh, tarot cards. Mm -hmm. uh, in in the current campaign, and somebody used the death card to trap a ghost uh, on the fly, and it was like, okay, so we're now we're mixing Ghostbusters with tarot cards and tattered magic magic system to do crazy things that I had no idea that it could do, and yet we're having a lot of fun with it. So, um, the sky's the limit, so long as you're you're willing to entertain that uh, as a referee. I think I don't even what was I don't even know if I answered your question. There. <laughs> I, I went again, went very far afield. Hey, it's if if I was a, if I was a more structured show that had a that had a script and had a definite plan about how things were going to go, I may I may get get on you about that, but yeah. I don't because okay. um as long because you and I have both refereed for a significant amount of time enough to know that um. There is no, there is no such thing as anything that goes according to plan. <laughs> <laughs> very true, very true. Like, 
I've al I've always told I've always told my students that the great secret is the great secret of it all is that we're just making this up as we go. <laughs> That's true. Every day. Um. Now, I think one of the th one of the things that I think is definitely to the benefit to that whole sky's the limit thing is that there isn't a system of advantage disadvantage relationships when it comes when it comes to sp when it comes to spell creation. Yeah. And. Now, granted, there's still the adva there's still the um, advantage disadvantage part that's just intrinsic to inversion twenty, but I think you know exactly what I mean when I talk about an ad a, a um, advantage disadvantage um, pool. Yeah, totally. Like like having um, like vamp vampire, you have in that system you have advantages and disadvantages mm -hmm. that may power you up in different ways yeah um we we kind of have that in the inverse 20 system as far as traits uh where you can have traits that may boost um particular attributes but because the attributes we limit between you, you can only like have a max of 18 um there's always the chance to fail there's usually the chance that you can make you can make things better or worse for yourself if you really desire to. Mm -hmm. um, so it's still there, but I don't think it, it. It's less a. It's more of a guideline than a boundary at that point. I think so. Um, I don't worry about it too much, yeah. honestly. Now, I'd like to now. Um, Obviously, there's a there's a handful of magical affinity traits that each of them reflects a different a different sort of, and I'm using finger quotes on this spell casting. Yeah. Um, that that's that's potentially possible. Um, what I'd like what I'd like to go with a, with a few with a few of them is I'd like to li like to give a few examples of that and. And um, I'd be curious what your what some of the um media inspirations for the for that particular trait may have been, okay. either directly or indirectly. And I'll I'll start with I'll start with one that's fa that's fairly obvious in um, craft elements. Well, that's obviously Avatar. Mm -hmm. uh, um, really, just about any um. Like Miyazaki film or or the last Avatar, th those would probably be the two the two biggest influences there, just from the perspective of um, harnessing and then using raw elemental energy. You know the earth, uh, wind, fire, um, all, all that kind of stuff. I always wanted to. Well, even in the old Mobius system, we had the idea of managing elements and uh i i always was in, enamored by that idea so there is something um somewhat cathartic about launching a fireball at your enemies always even if you end up pissing off the rest of the party because of friendly fire <laughs> even if you piss off the rest of the party with friendly fire and there is a chance that you could fail and if it blows up in your face that could 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 be bad so and the bigger the spell is, the the worse it gets. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Um, now to go a little bit more esot esoteric with this, um, craft movements. Okay, so craft movements is definitely a martial arts kind of magic. Where, let's say, um, you have a Dragon Ball Z kind of gathering of power in the tai chi kind of approach where mm -hmm. you're gathering momentum or uh energy from the air around you and throwing it at your enemies um we have had a lot of fun with this we and it first showed up in the the wild west we had a, a gal who played a a martial artist and we started playing with this idea of um powering up a punch for example or um launching yourself into the air to do one of those flying kicks that we mm -hmm. see in in like even jackie chan or, or jet lee movies um so that was always the idea there um 
No, one one that I th one that I th that I was that I was curious about when it came to its interpretation because like there's a bad joke I could make with it, but um, craft sounds. <laughs> yeah, so you have to have a bard, right? <laughs> so um, as long as I can remember, I, I have always been intrigued by the idea of a bard in, in classic literature um playing in the background and uh, helping power up the armies that go into battle even even more recently if you look at the most recent mad max film when they have the guys playing electric guitars on the back of those vehicles and just you know slaying it and playing hard rock they're still bards they're they're in, in making their their uh their side feel powerful right mm -hmm. so the uh, you could go that approach, or you could go even more primitive and go with maybe um, the the good old primitive drum styles that would sometimes be used for communication, or maybe um, powering you up before a battle. So it it really depends on what you, how you see that kind of thing. I could definitely go with anything from whistling or music or whatever else. Sadly, I, I have to say, nobody has picked it up yet. Uh, um, I haven't seen anybody play with it yet. Uh, if I get a chance to play, to actually play in a campaign, I, I might have to create a, a bard just to play with that. But I, I, uh, I already I like know one idea. way I'd do it. Yeah? <laughs> um, are, you fam are you familiar with a game called Brutal Legend? I am not. <laughs> um. Brutal Legend was Tim Schafer's love letter to all things metal, including the fact that um, one of your one of your primary weapons is a guitar named Clementine. That in the in the real world is just a normal guitar. When it got transported into the age of metal, along with along with the protagonist Eddie Riggs, that um, gets that guitar a lot could could um have some magical effects. Ranging from playing it to make a lightning strike, or do, or do or do effectively pyrotechnic style magic, um, and and um even some even something like literally mel melting someone's face off. <laughs> I like it. Um, well, that's the that's the kind of thing that com that comes to mind when it comes to bars. Because I'll be I'll be flat out honest. Um. Bards have gotten a bad rap over the years. They have, I agree. Um, and I'll probably—I did an article about this a decade ago, and I'll probably—I'll probably revisit it. But I'd say a lot of it comes from people getting way too hung up on the on the idea of the troubadour style bard. Yeah, and yeah, yeah, even more so is. on the whole, on the whole idea that you have to have a um. A instrument in general, and especially because a lot of troubadours had it, a string instrument. Yep. Um, the Witcher, the 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 TV show on on Netflix, mm -hmm. is a good example of that, right? Jaskier is is the troubadour style. Um, I'm not, so it's funny. So we we actually have a guy who played a character for a while who used poetry. And he didn't do it through craft sounds. He did it through craft language. So mm -hmm. that's the power of words to power his spells. And he, rather than sing the lyrics of a song, he would actually look up poetic phrases that he could use that kind of gave the flavor of what he was going for. Mm -hmm. And that worked amazingly well. So I, I think that bards get a bad rap, but I think that there is there are so many different ways you could approach that idea that it doesn't have to be your traditional troubadour, um, and you could do some fun things like I don't know I, I I like the idea of melting somebody's face off with a with an electric guitar. I mm -hmm. think that would be hellish uh, and yet very cool. So um, I am definitely open to people going above and beyond and using these things in ways i had no idea so 
and that brings that that brings me to a bit of a spin on this question because over the past um, one one author who I um, who I've joked about want, wanting whatever drugs he's on is Brandon Sanderson, and okay. most recently he's known for um, the Mistborn series of uh, books that he's do- that he's done, which did get adapted into an RPG, but that's but that's beyond the point. What I'm curious, what I'm curious about, and I'd like to pick your brain on this, is how you'd interpret um, it, one of one of his pr- one of his primary forms of magic in the Mistborn series, allomancy. Um, it's the use of metal. It's the idea. The idea is um, somebody who there are two types of of allomancers. There's mistings. People who can only use one type of metal and misborns, people who can use all of them. Okay. Um, they'll can they'll ingest a metal and are able to effectively burn the metal that they've in, the metal that they've ingested in order to achieve um, some sort of effect. That's cool. What sort what sort of trait do you suppose would be um, would be the would be the closest analog to how that works? I would go with craft elements, funny enough, simply because if it's a gathering, it would be pretty simple because it is a, a naturally occurring thing. Uh, whether it's easy to get to or not is a different story, but the idea of being able to collect a particular ore or um, refine it so that it can be used as a, in some ingestible form. Mm-hmm. Um, and then using that as power and having each, I'm guessing each, I I have not read the Mistborn series. I've heard of it and know of it. I'm guessing that different, uh, qualities of metal have a different array of powers or a different range of abilities. Um, different. Now, when it comes to the quality of the metal, that's that's mostly just a matter of making sure you're not, making sure you're not ingesting something that's going to be too toxic for you. Um, when it comes to, like, the, when, the quality of the metal doesn't matter as much as the type of metal. Um, for example, I, iron can pull, can pull on nearby metals, whereas, um, steel can push, um, some, something like, um, co- copper and bronze can hide or reveal al- alimentic, um, abilities and so on. Cool. Now, obviously, this is obviously this is a um, this is a vast simplification of it, and there are more es- there are more there are some metals that have more esoteric effects. Um, one of one of them, of course, being being things like gold, which can affect time, but you're not but in the setting that's going to be hard to find. That's cool. Um. I would keep it simple mm-hmm. and just go with craft elements, and then there would be a little bit of a negotiation between the player and the referee to, to figure out what are the bounds of what is available, or how much of it is available, where do you get it from, and then what can you do with the, the individual metals. And if you ingest more of it, uh, of a particular one, do you get additional like points of power? So it'd be more temporary, it sounds like, because I'm guessing it's more digested. Yeah, digest digesting a certain digesting a certain amount will will confer a set of um, charges. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I would go with craft elements. That that'd be a a, a pretty direct relationship. Mm-hmm. Um, that it would be a little different, just because it would be. Like if if you ingest it and you don't use it, does it go away? Like if you eat food, it passes through you, whether you're being super active or not. So, um, is the magic treated the same way in the Sanderson books? Um, I think it 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 is, but it's one it's one of those things where it where um it does ha- it does happen sl- it does happen. Sl- one, it ca- um you can lose it if you don't if you don't use it, which is the reason yeah. why um 
a lot of people who do have some sort of some sort of um, allomantic ability will ingest it right before using it. Okay. And they'll and be, and be, as a result, they'll use it. It's usually a case of it'll it'll pass through you in a few in a few hours. So make sure to use those charges before then. Otherwise, it's wasted. And getting those metals, especially especially some of certain um, certain more esoteric um, effects, is a lot harder to come by. So you don't want to waste it. Yeah. Yeah, I, 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 that would totally work. Mm -hmm. um, although one one thing I was curious about when it came to the concept of craft items. Now you mentioned um, earth, fire, water, and air when it came to uh, when it came to craft elements, yeah. but I'm curious if if somebody wanted to could could they use a elemental structure that's not as um, Hellenistic? Sure. Yeah. In fact, um, let, let's say maybe life and death could be considered elements mm -hmm. um or um i don't know what, what give me an example of something that would be less cut and dried than a, than a traditional uh elements of greek myth um i would i was go the the um approach that i was thinking of is the is the approach is the um approach that's used in the each in um this in the each Ching, um the eight which has eight elements on the on its um trigrams okay i know of the i ching i i have not read the I Ching, so yeah what are the eight i'm guessing it has the basic the basics in there yeah um let me find a pro let me find a proper image so I can build so I can build around it. But um, earth, thunder, fire, um, valley, heaven, wind, water, and mountain. Interesting. Okay. Sure. So long as so long as there's some meaning or some uh, like a one to one relation that that you could draw. So, in, in the system, your craft or your magical affinity trait kind of gives you the ability to gather the power that you use to cast the spells and using it. Mm -hmm. So, um, if you were gathering from mountain, that might be simply... That could be as easy as picking up rocks. It could be um, walking a mountain path. Perhaps there are uh, trails that you walk that give you certain uh, a certain amount of power because you're absorbing the mountain's energy. Um, heaven is an interesting one. I don't know how you would do that. Perhaps that's like sky gazing and that's more astronomy, uh, watching heavenly bodies mm -hmm. or uh, speaking with the dead. Even maybe you, you may be going through a graveyard and and. Uh, interacting with ghosts, um, you definitely you'd have to play a little bit, I think, to, to make those work. But I don't see why you couldn't. Mm -hmm. That's one of the reasons why I left it as open as I did. Um, there's so many there's so many different frameworks. Uh, whether you're doing dealing with myth or legend or uh, philosophy, that you could bring in just about anything. Yeah, and I'm I'm guessing that um. Even even though you have even though you have um, attributes associated with these traits, that it doesn't mean that those attributes have to be the be all end all for it. Um, That's true. Especially since if you're if you're dealing with somebody whose magic is a bit more natural and not as um, studied, like like since since we brought up Avatar earlier, I'll use that as an example. In that particular case. Education for the craft elements trait wouldn't. No, I agree. I would go with something like fit. athletics, athletics, or even presence. Mm -hmm. So willpower or physical ability. Yeah that that would that would be that would be a little bit more that would be a little bit more apropos. Whereas 
I'd say if somebody was using um, craft language for the purpose of using um, true naming, a la from Ursula K. Le Guin's books, um, that would definitely require that would definitely require education as as its attribute, or or um, awareness, mm -hmm. more of a feeling than a than a knowledge. But yeah, yeah I mean, totally. I, I could just about any attribute if you could. If you're at my table and you argue, uh, give me a, a, a reasonable argument for, for using a particular attribute, I'm all in. Yeah. Um, now, when it come when it came to wait, now obviously there's obviously magic has to come from somewhere, and there's going to be some sort of resource. Um, what I'm curious about is how the how that resource, when it came to essence, um was iterated upon versus how it was early on to where it is now with tattered magics. Uh, that was always, so in the initial version that we did with the Western, we did a lot with um, like gathering power. So in a Tai Chi kind of kata form for the martial artist or your, there was a medicine man that, um, did Native American prayer circles and and uh, danced uh, and burned in you know uh, sage and different things to to gather power. Um, we didn't really narrow it down. We didn't really like say, "Hey, this is the way you're going to do it." We left it really, really open because we didn't know at that point. Uh, and then later on, as we started going through the, the process of kind of figuring out what these affinities were, it became more apparent that some of them would work like, again, we don't, we don't really box you in. So if you're using craft language, for example, you could use writing or reading just time spent doing those two things to, to power up your magic or um, maybe if it, it was um, craft recipes, for example, which is pretty much a, a direct relation to alchemy. You're kind of picking up raw ingredients as you're wandering around. So it, it kind of became more logical to kind of narrow those Get what we're calling gather kind of actions um, as we started kind of focusing in on these different fields of magic. Um, but it, it was, it was a really natural uh, process. We didn't really have to force it too much. Uh, and, and in fact, craft movement still has the idea that you could do it through Tai Chi or Kata or whatever. So some of it's still even intact from all the way back to that, the Western Mm -hmm. And obviously, by do by doing it as traits, I'm ge I'm guessing taking that approach was to one, um, integrate it with inversion twenty, and two to make it so that somebody wouldn't have to feel forced into doing one particular um casting style all the time. Totally, yeah. In fact, some people have chosen like uh, in the current campaign we're running, we have our martial artist who. As craft, who started out with craft movements, she actually, her character learns craft symbols, and she uses craft symbols with tarot cards. Mm -hmm. So it becomes uh, she's actually kind of working to, towards a gambit kind of approach where she can throw cards at her enemies uh, as a distant ef effect uh, more than um, using it up of close and personal. So it, it has matured a little bit. It's, so we, I think she has two different fields of magic, and then each one has a different pool uh, uh, that it can pull on. Um, and I don't think she... I think she used education for craft symbols and then athletics for craft movements. So she's definitely got two different uh, approaches. We had another one, though, that was using craft language and craft recipes i th think to basically and both of them were uh, education based so it kind of increased her that that pool 
uh, dramatically, which was interesting. Um, so there's a huge pool of, of points to pull from for both. Um, and we really haven't, I mean, I don't argue a whole lot. We're in it to have fun. We're not mm -hmm. in it to, we're not in it to, you know, win any national championships or anything. It's not like there's money on the line here. So I, I let my players get away with murder. Sometimes literally they got, <laughs> they've gotten away with murder, uh, but in games, but um, it really is up to what the referee and the, the players want to do. So mm -hmm. now when it, now, um, when it comes to the when it comes when it comes to the create when it comes to the um the use of the um use of multiple disciplines have have there been any instances where somebody has tried to cast from two cast using two different um traits um simultaneously or in or in some sort of combination? I have not seen that yet. No, that would be an interesting question. Usually. All of the attempts that we've seen so far have been focused on a single uh, magical affinity. So it'll be like for the tarot instance, it's craft symbols. For the martial artist, it was craft movements. I haven't mm -hmm. seen anybody try to mix and match them. Yeah. But let me let me let me give a a, a big but there. We have the idea of group casting. Mm -hmm where you could have maybe two casters or four casters or a whole cult all working towards the same goal, kind of building this big miasma of magical uh, power to, I don't know, open a doorway to let Cthulhu in if you really want to. I don't know why you'd want to do that, but, you know, stranger things have happened. Um, or to in like an avatar when people are all working together to make uh, a wall or mm -hmm. it's an army where they're they're all spitting out rocks at the same time um we do have that idea of group uh, groups working towards a common goal i think i had in mind that they would be using the same um magical affinity trait but I could certainly see where, at least for like craft items, people craft items is basically prepping an item for another for another type of magic. So you're basically opening it up to um, maybe in, in if you're making a wand of fireballs, you're having somebody capture a fireball spell in the item. So you have two casters working together to. Um, develop a, a particular thing so it's possible i i haven't seen it happen um mm -hmm. it's one of those it's one of those things where i think it would be i think it would certainly be it would certainly be interesting to have these sort of to have these sort of multi-stage effects almost like the magic version of a rube goldberg um <laughs> yeah a rube goldberg device yeah plus some. Um, Something that definitely came to mind when I was thinking of the concept of somebody knowing mul knowing multiple traits is a case like say um John Constantine. Yep. Who just who just dabbles in whatever the hell he feels like at that moment. <laughs> um That's true. Yeah, he 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 kind of goes with the flow and uses many different varieties of magic mm -hmm. uh to to get his his job done. Or or to piss off Papa Midnight. Sometimes both. True. <laughs> True. Mm -hmm. Um. And when and the other the other thing that um pro that came that um I had con that I had considered during this because I've I think I've made it clear that I'm a big fan of the Final Fantasy series in the past, but um. There's a there's a couple of casting styles within within those games that I'm curious how something like that would would adapt within um, Tattered Magic's system because I do think that there is some possibility for it. The first one is um, is blue magic, which in the games blue magic is used by people who um, 
they would get, they would have to get hit by a given spell from a monster, and then they learn that um, particular spell. Oh, okay. And the other is the is the um, Rune Knight character archetype, which doesn't have um, MP on its own, but what it can do is whenever it cast, whenever it, they can act as a magical lightning rod, so that when a spell is cast, um, they end up get they end up getting the energy that would have been expended otherwise. Interesting, and you and use that to basically basically steal um, magic power. Okay. And now, now I realize both of these would be would be kind of tricky. But do you think do you think either of them would be doable with Tattered Magic's um, system? Totally. Um, so for the first one, you might actually have to kind of create a new discipline uh, to handle that, which wouldn't be out of the question. Uh, I'm working on some new new craft disciplines as it is. Mm -hmm. um, but it it would it sounds very specific. So can you is it sort of like rogue in the X-Men where you sort of steal the power and can turn it back against your enemies again? Yeah. I would. It's get. It's it's going to be a little more controlled than ro than rogue, obviously. But that's it. That's a good start. That's a good starting point. Okay. The o the only th the only real thing is that they have is that a blue mage has to actually get hit with that particular um, magic. Okay. Yeah, that that's a pretty specific setup. So I would have to create probably a different trait for it. Um. Which isn't, like I said, too difficult. It's just coming up with a trait and mm -hmm. figuring out what uh, what attribute you want to go with it. And then um, that would be more like... So we have some different styles of traits that don't kind of cast spells on their own. They're more like... Um, like Therianthropy is like, like lycanthropy and shape-changing. Um, or psychic sensitive, where you basically can read thoughts. It'd be more along those lines, where you're kind of taking in somebody else's power, taking in the damage from it. I'm guessing. Um, so you must be a little bit of a masochist, um, and um, turning that into something productive. So maybe. And then on the other side, uh, so the. The lightning rod is an interesting one. That'd be a, a another ability. So, what can that character do with the the ability, the energy that it brings in? The when it, um, in the case of blue, in the case of blue mages, they would just be able to mimic the uh, spell that that they were hit with. In the case of okay, rune, so like a reflection. Mm -hmm. In the case of rune, in the case of uh, rune knights. They would they they would have their own particular set of um spe of spells that they could that they could use, but they could but the thing is that they couldn't ge they can't generate the essence for it themselves. They have to use the runic ability to basically create a magical lightning rod, as I mentioned. I wonder if that would almost be a craft a spin on craft items, where you would be able to open yourself up to capture energy in maybe your armor or a sword or something along those lines to to and then you could redirect that energy maybe that's an item related power i don't know uh, i it's cer there's certainly a um po there's certainly a possibility in that regard um Obviously, something like this would be one, would be one that's going to be as open to interpretation as most of the disciplines are. Yeah, totally. Um, I like them both; they're cool. I, I have not played Final Fantasy, so I'm probably among the one percent of, of geeks that hasn't ever touched a Final Fantasy game. Um, I wouldn't be I wouldn't be too sure about that. Um. Because there's a there's a lot of there's a I'm pretty sure there's a lot of games that you've touched upon that I haven't and vice versa. So, from from I don't see that as some sort of mark of shame. I see that as 
hey, it's a new it's a new avenue to explore. Um. Oh, there you are. Yeah, I see. Like I said, I see. I see it as a kind of new avenue to explore more than anything else. No, it's cool. I like it, and and there's definitely room in the system to add tons of new stuff. Mm -hmm. um, the one that I'm starting to play with now is the idea of uh, celestial magic. So you would ha you would be gathering energy from the passing of the the cycle of the moon and and sun and stars. Um, meteors, um, uh, comets, that kind of thing, and then redirecting some of that energy into various um, star-themed spells. Maybe you're throwing a uh, shooting star at an enemy or calling down a meteor swarm, that kind of thing. So um, definitely every time I read something new, it's like, oh, that would be awesome. <laughs> and then I want to add it to the game. So, um, nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with that. Mm -hmm. um, besides, you besides with with a set, with a setup like this, you're almost expected to have some sort of well, not to put too fine a point in it, mad scientist. Oh yeah. And when it come now, when it comes to when it comes to the whole, when it comes to the um, the whole idea of 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 building of building power and building essence points and, and the like, um, during playtesting, was there were there ever instances of people being a little um, conservative with the point use, or was that not really the case? So there's two ways that a character can can gather if you're in battle. You can only gather a point or two, maybe up to four, and you have to, to do a trait roll to see whether you're successful or not. Mm -hmm. So it's very, and you're kind of wasting your actions in combat when you do that. Um, in Outside of combat, pretty much the, the standard way we've got it is every 15 minutes you do something, you gain die six points. So it does vary a little bit. Uh, you can have a really successful um, gathering of power over the course of an hour and regenerate your entire battery. Or you could have a really, really skimpy one um, where you only get like four points over the course of that hour. It really depends on um, how the dice roll for you. Mm -hmm. But the, the idea was always that you can be doing this all the time uh, in... One of the things that I liked about the Dresden Files is uh, one of his bracelet uh, powers was every time he moved, it gathered kinetic energy and powered things up. So that's kind of the idea that I was using here. Uh, you just kind of have to either have an item that works as a battery that you're charging up over time in the same way, or um, you yourself are the battery and you have to do it more uh, consciously. Um, so far, it has been pretty... Nobody's really gone crazy about it. Um, we've had some off days where maybe characters have more extended time to do this, so we kind of just kind of hand wave and say that say that they've um, gathered their, their energies uh, and filled their battery com uh, completely. Um, but nobody's really gone too crazy with it. I'm sure that somebody will try to min-max it somewhere. Um, but that's one of the nice things about this system. It's not. It's really difficult to min-max things. <laughs> so it, it's pretty flexible and there's always the referee who can say hey, that that's not cool. Let, let's, let's, let's try that a different way. Yeah, now when it comes... When it comes to um, artifacts, um, now give now um, given how, given how artifacts have worked throughout the years in cer in certain other games where they might be where they can potentially be a little too powerful, um, and give and given the importance of artifacts with with a, a discipline like craft items, um, 
how did you go about it to make sure that artifacts were um not were not op were not op compared to uh, compared to other particular types so um i did try to make sure that people didn't get too crazy uh with items although i'm sure somebody's going to do it um we haven't had anybody really just go crazy with it yet and i i think that's more a, a feature of having creative but disciplined players that i've played with and uh, as opposed to um the murder hobo kind of style of play although we mm -hmm. do get into that every once in a while so most of the items that we've created on the fly have been again pretty understated we haven't really done a whole lot to um overcharge them or make them too powerful one of the items that i really what we've really loved that i didn't think was going to turn out as well as it did was the idea of hungry armor so it's a fey uh, a fey artifact and essentially it will regenerate armor points if you feed it flesh so um as you might imagine that has turned out to be hilarious in various ways we had a player try to feed a corpse to it and that worked great but it picks up picks up the odor of whatever you feed it um but those are pretty limited powers in that they're they work really well and they're they're kind of fun uh but the item creation i think that was only like a two or three point um maybe even only a one uh, one point item creation where um it doesn't really the max it can do is the size of the armor points that you have um we've had a couple that you that act as like a battery you have to charge it before you can use it and then those are also only maybe two or I don't know maybe five point items so in that point at that case it can only store i don't know that's interesting let me think about this for a minute so i think if i go to do 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 some examples and i go to the items where are we here so, blah, blah, blah. How to craft an artifact. Yeah, so if the magic maker spends one point to create an item, it can only leverage a single point of magical energy at a time. So, um, when you're a caster, you have the ability to cast a spell that is up to your attribute value. So, if you have an attribute of 14, and you have the time to cast a 14-point spell, you can actually power up a spell to do a a shit ton of damage all at the same time. Items are a little more limited in that, uh, depending on the power of the guy that cre or the the creator. Uh, if if you only put in, let's say five points, the maximum that that item can harness is five points. So it'll store five points, and then if it has a, an ability, it can only use those five points that it has stored. So it's kind of a built-in limiter more than anything else. Mm -hmm. and, that, and that's the... The other, thing I'm the other thing I'm curious about is we've mentioned a chance for failure when it comes to casting. Does that also apply when it comes to artifact use? Like there's a chance that trying to activate a, um ability for an artifact could backfire. Uh... It probably could. I have not used it that way, but uh, another referee might choose to look at it that direction. Mm -hmm. um, for example, if you're casting a fireball and you roll a die, um, if you roll a critical failure, it could blow up in your face. Um, I could see that working. I just, I tend to be uh, more of a 
kind, benevolent GM than than anything else. So I haven't tried to do that to my players, but I can definitely see that uh, coming up. Um, one of the things that that I'm working on now, we're working on a, a new version of the game that'll be more like a Conan esque sword and sorcery sort of game and mm -hmm. i want to bring in the idea of epic items so y you have the ability to as a first level character if you are a maybe you're a, a conan style character mm -hmm. and you get a sword well that sword is going to level up with you a little bit slower than you might but it'll gain some additional traits as you uh grow with it uh, so that gives you the the um impetus to maybe keep that item and not change items every so often like uh, we do in uh, D&D where oh suddenly I, I, I don't want my long sword plus one anymore I need to go get a broad sword of slicing and dicing mm -hmm. um, so I kind of want to bring in that idea so that we have even a different uh, avenue for characters to, to kind of use these artifacts that grow so that we can have things like the eye and hand of Vecna, for example, from it from D and D, um, lying around, and then you have to negotiate with the item to to see if you can actually use it or not. So mm -hmm. we're trying to play a little bit more. Yeah, it's just that it's just that. Of course, afterwards you're gonna have an you're gonna have an item that won't shut up. <laughs> you could very much so. Yeah, uh, and and but this. It has a built-in thing where if you have a an epic character and your epic character dies, suddenly there's this the sword of Conan lying around, and it has all of this untapped potential. It has a bunch of traits in it, uh, so when you pick it up um, as a first-level character, and you're like, "Oh wow, this is this cool epic sword," it has all of these abilities, but you only get to tap into them one at a time. Because it was created before you, uh, so uh, I, I don't know. It'll be interesting to see how this all kind of flushes out. But we're still playing a little bit. Mm -hmm. Now, with that with that in mind, um, you meant you mentioned a bit of a you mentioned a bit of a Conan thing. What el what else do you do you see go do you see coming down the pipeline for um tat for tattered magics? Um. So. Uh, we have started looking at doing a creature catalog, so monster manual kind of thing, mm -hmm. um, as well as some new magical disciplines and some adventures. Uh, we did. Um, there is an adventure in the book that we that I actually used to spawn a campaign, and I have some adventures that I wrote as follow-ons. One of them is like a vampire hunt that I want to do. One of them is. Um, something that we haven't actually played through, but an expedition to Underhill. So the land of the Fae and uh, mm -hmm. sort of land of the lost. Um, uh, going through the fairy ring kind of thing. So some adventures, some additions. Um, there's still a lot in the, the queue for aliens and asteroids as well. Um, so we're still kind of expanding the universe a little bit at a time. The problem is I'm a limiting factor. So... Um, we have had some stuff get written by other writers and that's been fantastic, but, uh, it still takes a while to, to work through those and, uh, get them in editing and then do layout and commission art and all the rest of that. So, um, we have a lot on the plate. It's just figuring out how I can clone myself in this reality to, uh, get more out to our, our, uh, our users. And I'll def I'll definitely be um, I'll definitely be looking for looking forward to see to seeing that and and everything else that's co that's coming down the pike. Um, with that said, I do want to sincerely thank you once again for taking the time to brave the hell that is technology and time zones to come up to the temple. It wasn't it wasn't as bad this time. Discord was good to us, so mm -hmm. we'll we'll just take what we got. Yeah. And of, of course, as as always, anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. And as you know, drinking is not mandatory here, but it is encouraged. 
Thank you, sir. I appreciate the offer, and I appreciate the open door, and it's been great talking with you tonight. Mm -hmm. And, of course, a sincere thanks to everybody who took the time out of their schedule to enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the Internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra. I am your gaming monk. Stay fucking frosty, everybody. <laughs>